everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. Really happy to be here today, and I'd like to introduce everyone to our program. We have an amazing program, and I didn't change the topic, but it actually is um, no, it's our number nine, and we have uh, two great um, presenters. We have, I mean, sponsors today. We have uh, Saudi Ramco, Ramco Services, and we have Drone Geosciences, and our platform collaboration sponsor is um, Strathus. And today's focus is on, on um, CCUS and also on Earth Images. And so we have an amazing program where we'll have some introductions from the leadership, but then from 7.30 to 8.05, we'll have panelists with five to seven minute presentations. So we will be splitting between talking about um, images, Earth images, and how they're used, and also CCUS, different aspects of it. I'm really excited about that. And then we will have a new technology showcase, which will be Rekha Patel, who will walk us through the collaboration platform and our geothermal challenge from, from last time. So our last, um, set, this is session nine, session eight had a focus on geothermal and and, and uh, learning from other industries. So I'd like to turn uh, the, the platform over to our president, APG president, Rick Fritz. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll um, ask you to chat with us. Sure, thank you, Susan. I wanna thank all of you for attending and I'll be very brief because we have a lot to do. I wanna thank especially the speakers and uh, I look forward to hearing from you and, and for Susan for setting this up. Uh, this has been a, a, an exciting series. I'm looking to hear more about drones. I think that's uh, whenever I do finally retire, I'd like to be a drone operator. So I think uh, and fly those things around, especially after seeing, uh, seeing the one on Mars uh, moving around. The, um, but I'm also very interested in CCUS and I think that uh, uh, APG is uh, unique, unique, uniquely situated for that uh, with, uh, you know, geoscientists are very versatile. And we just had our first major CCUS conference with over 500 people. And um, that was, uh, uh, you know, I learned a lot at that program. I learned a lot of it is very much like, a lot of the operations are very much like uh, petroleum. I mean, you, it's, it's drilling, it's high pressure, it's things you have to deal with blowouts and and so on. So that's uh, that's one thing I learned on, on CCUS especially. So with that, uh, just uh, relax, enjoy a nice evening uh, with your favorite uh, beverage, and uh, and enjoy the uh, and enjoy the talks. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. I'd also like to um, turn the platform over to Meredith Faber, a DPA president. Thanks, Susan. Good evening, uh, morning, afternoon, depending on where you are, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, thanks again for the invitation, Susan, to speak at this event. Very excited to learn more about this subject. I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, this will complete my evening of uh, great seminars from AAPG. I was in the cognitive bias workshop earlier that was uh, put on by the Stimulating Diversity and Inclusion uh, AAPG Special Interest Group. So. Uh, be on the lookout for those. We'll have another one in September, in July and in September with Michelle Ann of the master's course. Um, they've been very enlightening and a lot of good information there. Um, but if you have any questions regarding DPA or uh, what we do and how to get involved, be sure to get in touch and I'll point you in the right direction. Thanks. Well, thank you. And I'd also like to um, turn the, the um, floor over now to uh, Ursula Hamas, who's EMD president. Good evening and welcome everyone. Susan put together another amazing and exceptional uh, program. I want to just quickly talk about EMD. We do everything but CTUS. We have uh, nine different committees that uh, uh, range from geothermal to uranium to uh, helium, oil and gas, uh, tight gas, uh, but I wouldn't, don't want to bore you and go all over it. You should uh, please check out our website. We also have an EMD YouTube channel where we post our webinars that are quite interesting. 
some of them uranium, some of them freeware for independence. I am going to post the link into the chat. I also wanted to alert you of the uh, SEG APG conference uh, end of September in, in Denver, a part virtual, part uh, in-person conference. And we're going to have an amazing program um, with the support of SEG, where we're going to actually merge some of the technologies um, in, in, in different sessions from geophysics and uh, the alternative uh, um, minerals, alternative um, uh, energies. With further ado, no further ado, I hand it over to, I think, uh, Julian. Thank you, Susan, for doing that. Thank you. Welcome, Julian. Hi, welcome, everyone. Uh, same as Meredith. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's uh, thank you again, Susan, for organizing another fantastic series of events. Uh, I am Julian Chen, and I'm with the AAPG Sustainable Development Committee. And our goal is to communicate broadly the positive technical, economic, environmental, as well as the social benefits of the petroleum industry, in addition to its collective efforts towards sustainable development. So we're doing a lot of that in that space. Um, myself and my co-host, we currently host a sustainable development podcast on the Energy Insights series with AAPG, where we bring on different guests to talk about what sustainable development means across different major companies, but then also in their experiences as well. And not to take up too much time, but I'll just stop at this point. Uh, we'll also be hosting a special session for ACE uh, this coming year, where the focus will be on the young professionals. Uh, the title is From Petroleum Industry to Energy Industry, Global Young Professional Perspectives on a sustainable future. And what we're gonna talk about is really what does the energy company of the future look like? As Rick Fritz has mentioned many times before, it's an energy integration, right? It's gonna be a balance of different sources and how can geologists take the, that part, that step in that direction? So we look forward to having you. Thank you again, Susan. We really look forward to hearing from such a wonderful line of speakers. And I'm very excited to, to hear and learn more. Oh, great. Well, thank you, Julian. And Speaking of sustainability, next week our focus will be water management, but we'll also again be talking about um, earth images using, used for that. So we'll be um, including um, additional per perspectives. So we're, we're trying to use technology that you can use today and also for the transition. So that's kind of a theme. So what we can use applies to traditional and transition. So very happy to introduce our first speaker, Amanda O'Connor, L3 Harris, and like to welcome you and, and encourage you to share your screen and, and um, we look forward to it. And also want to thank, oh, just a quick thanks again to Aramco Services Company for being our uh, series sponsor and today's sponsor is um, um, Drone Geosciences and Strathos. Hi everyone, are you seeing my screen? Yes. If I can get it, there we go, presentation mode. So thank you very much, Susan, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I always enjoy these sessions uh, with this crew here. There's always good questions and um, some really innovative uses of imagery and other technologies uh, to support the energy and, and petroleum jump, geology industry and energy as well. So um, I just have one slide. Um, my background is remote sensing and it has been for about over the last 20 years. Um, and when Susan invited me to talk here, a couple of things have been happening in the remote sensing industry that made me want to um, participate in this. Um, the, the company I work for, L3 Harris Geospatial Solutions, we've uh, developed software for working with satellite imagery, drone imagery, aerial, you name it, radar, SAR, sonar, <laughs> pretty much all kinds. So my background is in hyperspectral remote sensing. And you know, one of the things that I've spent most of my career trying to get rid of is the atmosphere because it obscures the things I'm trying to look at on the ground. But lately it's becoming kind of a, um, um, I don't know how to say it, a star in remote sensing. It has been for a while, but more so because there's actually organizations that are putting money behind it and putting effort into studying to try to understand how um, certain atmospheric gases behave and monitor how things, um, certain atmospheric gases change over time. 
So the image that I have up on the uh, upper right is uh, one from JPL. It's explaining the Avarice hyperspectral sensor um, that has many uh, bands for imaging the ground uh, collected at very narrow wavelengths of light. And those narrow wavelengths, um, certain features in the atmosphere and ground have absorption features. So in the, the image here, what you're seeing is basically atmospheric absorption features. So you have oxygen, you have ozone, you have um, CO2, you have methane in there. Um, on the bottom here is Landsat showing um, that you, you get a broader sense. So some of these features that are very narrow can be blurred and not necessarily seen uh, with a broader band sensor. And so that's just kind of very high level hyperspectral road sensing. I mean, you can study this stuff for years, so it's kind of hard to condense into five minutes. But um, one of the things that's happened recently is an organization called Carbon Mapper. Um, so it's carbonmapper.org was funded. Um, it's a nonprofit institution with the state of California and a joint task force basically with uh, NASA JPL to put an Avarice class sensor in space. Um, as well as with, I think the Arizona State and Planet are supporting the efforts for that as well. And the, the main motivation there is to study um, methane escapes um, from space. And the image down here on the lower right, you can see this is basically a coal mine. And you can see these are some of the images. I'm not sure how well it comes through, but um, basically you can see a methane plume coming out of that coal mine. You can also see a different kind of plume there. And my understanding is this is going to be a constellation. So you'll be able to see things either throughout the day or perhaps day after day. Um, I'm still getting information on that. And then there's also another company that will shortly be on orbit. They're gonna have a high, hyperspectral small sat constellation that's called Orbital Sidekick. And they're also looking to invest in um, the, the methane detection market um, aspects of working with hyperspectral imagery so that you can um, either see where you're having some significant escapes, you can alert plant managers, you can better control um, anything that might be happening in that case. And we also know that we're entering a different regulatory environment with the Paris Climate Accords, with local um, climate regulations, especially in the state of California, and being able to better control and contain um, you know, carbon trapping emissions. So this is not only for looking at um, point sources like this coal mine, you can look at you know, coal mines, factories, pipeline activities, emissions from cars, buildings, anything along those lines that's going to be emitting methane or other um, substances that can help trap, um, you know, trap gases in our atmosphere. So essentially, I, I'm seeing a shift in remote sensing of, of using this. The technology has been around for a really long time to do this kind of work. Um, LIDAR, there's um, certain LIDAR bands that um, you can actually detect gases with if they're tuned to the right wavelengths. That's been around for quite a while, but it never seemed to really pick up as much steam as um, hyperspectral remote sensing. And certainly you can do, um, you can study emissions in kind of a secondary manner by looking at um, vegetation in particular around sites like these, um, you might see a degradation in vegetation health with a multispectral sensor. Uh, as a, you would see that with a hyperspectral sensor as well, but we all know multispectral sensors, they you know, are great because they're really high resolution um, and the data is quite frankly, a little bit easier to work with. So bottom line, I think there are some opportunities on the horizon for people who want to better understand either the situation of, of a certain, factories, plants, pipelines, et cetera, and better understand what escapes are happening there, as well as understand from a regulatory standpoint where you're having problems or where you may need to address something in the operation of these types of facilities. So um, I think that's, that's probably close to five minutes and I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's just kind of the quick and dirty of um, kind of where I'm seeing remote sensing heading and uh, the carbon, um, uh, in the carbon detection world. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And that, that's really exciting and we really appreciate it. We'll, we'll save the questions for the end. I want to mention that we do have a, a CCUS LinkedIn group now to encourage you to, to um, join it and, and post information and links to white papers, et cetera. And Amanda, it would be great if you wanted to post links to 
some of the information okay. in the chat and also in, in uh, the LinkedIn group. Yep, I will do so. Great. So our next speaker is, is Ron Bell, Drone Geosciences. And I'm really glad to see you again, Ron. Uh, so well, welcome. <laughs> Uh, let me begin my see if I can't share my screen and start my slideshow. Uh, see what I got going here. There we go. From the beginning, can you see that? Uh, not yet. Screen number two. Oh boy. I apologize. I'm just getting to where I. I do enough of these things. See, there we go. There, oh, I got to hit that. All right. There you go. Yeah, now I'm going to share from the beginning. Unfortunately, I am, uh, uh, I tend to drone on, and I do mean that somewhat uh, humorously. Um, I, I'm going to talk about drone geophysics. I'm going to talk about some of the work I've been doing for the last five years. Uh, I, um, Basically, since it's a geological crowd, I'm going to I'm kind of focus on geological mapping. Uh, the, we uh, I recently formed a company with uh, 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 several other people, and uh, and we call it Drone Geoscience. And this seemed like a great opportunity to to introduce you all to what we can do. Uh, this slide here, uh, the top part of it, uh, above the blue line, those are all, with the exception of gamma ray spectrometry. Those are all sort of remote sensing things. They're commonly used today. The previous speaker spoke about that a bit. What I'm going to talk about is the things that are geophysical. And I've done a much more magnetics. That's a pretty common uh, technology being used today. I'm now working on some electromagnetic stuff. And there are some ground penetrating radar things on a drone. And I will soon be working with a gamma ray spectrometer, literally within the next couple of weeks. So uh, this slide here kind of gives a sort of an indication of what the geoscience applications of drones would be. Uh, we are doing, can do a lot of address, a lot of those things from the, from the point of view of geological mapping, mapping rock type, alteration. Uh, we're combining not only the geophysical data, but with the remote sensing surface type of data. Uh, and I won't go too far into that, uh, other than the fact that the number 10 there, this is just a small segment of what is possible and what will be possible in the, in the future. Um, the benefits of drones are basically we can access areas we couldn't access before. We can fly ultra low uh, altitude surveys, we can, meaning that we can increase our signal strength, see things that we couldn't see before. And I'm talking in terms of a geophysical sense. Uh, we can improve our spatial data density. We can enhance our signal strength. I already said that, I uh, apologize. Uh, we'll lower our operational costs, improve our safety of our field staff, and then reduce risk to property damage, facilitate temporal change. And probably the thing that I get most excited about is I can actually get the data turned around and actually do something with it right there in the field. So um, this is uh, the magnetometer I've been using. I, I have been using this for the last four years. Uh, it is a uh, chip-based uh, cesium vapor magnetometer, very sensitive. We hang it below the aircraft. Those photos there of, are of uh, the one on the very right here. Uh, right here is actually, uh, um, oh, the one right here I can't see on my other screen. Uh, that's the prototype. It looked like a bomb, so they actually redesigned the, the thing so it didn't look like a bomb. Uh, then I'm working with two different EM systems. Those are for shallow investigations. Uh, and I'm also in the process of working with testing out a gamma ray spectrometer. And what we see, with, what this will be useful for is actually doing uh, geologic mapping uh, in addition to other things. But it is not all about the actual drone. It's about what we do with the data. And so we're working with a company that's based in Houston. It's a, it's a startup, it's called Impact AI. And uh, this data set here that you, you see is a data set uh, of, of a pipeline. It's located in Colorado. And th that compares very well to the original data set they were working with, which is a, a sort of an academic data set. Uh, for, uh, and then this is the, the uh, in 
work that they did on it, applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to better understand uh, and determine where this pipeline is, uh, as the depth and the precise location. Those are things we're working on right now. And the idea is that this type of technology would be applicable to doing uh, geologic mapping, ge uh, analysis and interpretation for uh, various types of applications. Um, one of the things we have been doing, this data set that you see there is a magnetic data set from uh, 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 the oil fields of uh, around West Texas. Uh, the idea, the, the point of this one is you can see the, 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 the these big red blobs here are actually the, the pump jacks. Uh, there's a pipe, two pipelines there. And then what we were doing was scanning the area to make sure there wasn't a an existing or a, a, an undocumented uh, oil well that um, because they were going to do some excavation there. Uh, this is an example of using it to actually locate four oil wells. This oil wells. This is in uh, um, Colorado. Uh, it's actually an area that I just was out there the other day. There's a bunch of houses on this site now. Uh, what we did is we flew from one spot. That's actually that spot right there. We actually covered four different areas using the magnetometer, and we're able to identify and locate. Um, the precise location of these wells, which is a big deal here in Colorado. Um, this is an example of a, a geologic mapping problem. This, uh, we call this the, the Crestone Crater. In the background, you can see the uh, Great Sand Dunes from the Great Sand Dunes National Park in Southern Colorado. And this is a magnetic data set right here that, that comes from, um, let me put it right there, Crestone Crater, Great Sand Dunes, um, magnetic data set that the uh, geophysics students at Colorado School of Mines had collected. And when I got this, I uh, uh, was alerted to this. I said, that's great. That's a place that I can go test and fly this prototype. The reason it's magnetic is that there's 4% magnetite within the, the surface sands. Uh, we're trying to, the original uh, concept of this, or at least explanation for this is that it was an impact crater, uh, but there's no, there's no other, uh, other than the shape of it, there's no other evidence that there was in fact an impact. They're still looking for it, uh, but, <clears throat> but the, uh, we have a different sort of idea of why, why it's caused, uh, why, it is, uh, why it exists and why it hasn't eroded away. Um, but this was a test area and, and what I'm going to go through here is quickly go through the set of work I've been doing since 2000. 17, 2018, 2019, I've actually flown surveys over this Crestone Crater. This is the first survey right here. You can see we have multiple sorties. Uh, and then that in the background there is a, is a ground magnetic survey. Uh, this on the right here is the color contour map of the raw uh, drone magnetic data. And then set into that is the raw data from the drone mag, I mean, the ground mag survey. And the correlation was just so great that I it just I got really excited when I when I was able to put this together and said we've got something here. Uh, so that but I realized that there was there was some questions that I couldn't really answer. One was why was did I have a big magnetic high? I did have a response from the crater, but there was those, these other circular res responses which really piqued my interest. Plus it appears that as though there was a magnetic low as a trough that was running through there. Uh, so back in, in 2018, I brought the prototype down again, and we flew a much bigger area. This is a square mile, and then this uh, in the uh, uh, see so you can see there's two lows there. We got the big high. There's uh, I stripped away the long uh, the long wavelength data so that we're actually looking at the nearer surface uh, sources. The uh, again we, we're actually seeing the the fact that we're we're these lows here. It started to, I drew some lines on there to indicate where the faults might be. At, and um, unfortunately, most geophysicists say we have more, need more data. I actually concluded I needed more data on this because I needed to set a bigger site. But I went down in 2019 with, uh, with, a, uh, with the idea that I was going to use the uh, production version of the, rather than a prototype. Uh, part of it was just to test the production version, but part of it was to see how well I could repeat what I acquired before. So I, I flew a smaller survey, which is equivalent to what we did, what the School of Mines survey did, uh, students did. And then, uh, then we flew a little bigger survey, about a half a mile by a half a mile. Uh, that was really, we got good data with that. We flew the, all of these from one location. 
Uh, and I didn't actually have to step inside the park, even though I had a, a permit to do a scientific investigations in the park. I could have done it on the ground inside the park or in the air and inside the park, but uh, I didn't have to, which was actually one of the uh, things that made it easier to, for us to do our research down there. And, and then I went to another edge. area from oh, the park. Ron. We, uh, Sorry, uh, uh, it's a parking lot. And then we, we, in order to be able to do this one, this is 2.75 square miles. We, I lifted the pilot up in a, in a, a boom lift and he was able to maintain visual line of sight, which is a requirement of the FAA with the aircraft during the survey. And we were able to fly this, cover this area with a, within a day and a half. Uh, which is phenomenal from when I first started doing doing the work. Uh, I, I guess I, I wanted to, to give you a little sense of what is doable. And I thank you for your attention and uh, the opportunity to, to share with you what I get very excited about. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's great, Ron. Oh, that's amazing. You went through so much information and, and you did it so efficiently. That's great. Well, Thank you. <laughs> I'm not always so efficient. <laughs> that was really good. Well, thank yeah, you. If, if anybody was, wants my slide deck, I'll just let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll email it to them. Oh, great. And I want to remind everyone that you'll be getting an email um, from me with a link to the recording. So um, you can watch this many times. Okay. So thank you, Ron, and um, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Kip Coddington, University of Wyoming. He'll be talking about corporate and governmental support for CCUS 2022 and beyond. So welcome, so, Kip. Yes, thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm broadcasting live from an 1880 Victorian home in downtown Laramie, Wyoming. So excuse the... Uh, uh, what you see is construction in the background. So I suspect I'm an outlier on this panel in that I'm an attorney. So I, I'm not a, a geologist, I'm not a geophysicist, I'm not a geoscientist, but my background is in law and I've got a chemical engineering degree and I've literally spent my entire life working with those in the geoscientist, Joe's in the, the, the geoscience community trying to advance this technology called carbon capture and storage. And so I'm here to bring a little bit of commercial insight to what your other panelists are, are providing. So I'm acutely interested in first for, um, you know, students on this call and those that are below the age of 40 in terms of career paths, what does it look like in terms of trying to decarbonize fossil fuels? And so if I, if I was a 25 year old petroleum geologist, what does my career path look like? And I have the privilege of, of working with those folks and I have some, as an older person, I have some insights on that. They also have some insights as a, uh, you know, someone who's, who's been trying to advance these projects for, for the bulk of my life. I also founded the North American Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Um, I, I was the founder of the ISO committee that uh, resulted in the first technical standard for CO2 during enhanced oil recovery. So I'm exceedingly comfortable with um, these topics. I'm also a co-PI on the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project up in Gillette. So speaking as a lawyer, what I can say is that under the Paris Agreement, it is understood that those in the geosciences, those in the geosciences who understand how to manage physical carbon dioxide are likely to be in high demand. And, and that, is that is because under the climate models that we've gone from trying to achieve mid-century um, stabilization goals to trying to go net negative, because as a matter of amount of CO2 we're putting in, into the atmosphere, we're apt to be putting more uh, in, 
into the sea into the atmosphere that we have to manage and thus and thus pull back out. So we're now in a realm where we're, we're looking at so-called net net emission technologies. We're looking at technologies like direct air capture, and there's numerous oil and gas companies that are looking at technologies. You have to get your mind around this. They're looking at technologies where you have to uh, not only reduce emissions of CO2 from the atmosphere, but you have to draw CO2 emissions out of the atmosphere and then do something with them. Take CO2 to products or, or more likely, in my view, store that CO2 in a geologic formation, uh, a saline formation or a, uh, an enhanced oil, oil recovery operation. And so, so to answer the question, it is clear to me that the corporate world and the political world is in a bipartisan way really strongly behind this technology, this technology being carbon capture and storage. And we see that in bills in Congress. We see that in enacted tax incentives. We see that in state laws, um, in numerous um, aspects. So to conclude, if I was a 25-year-old petroleum geologist, I would want to burnish my resume and say a little bit about how petroleum engineering is not also about producing fossil fuels. It's also about managing carbon dioxide emissions in the subsurface. And I see no evidence in the corporate world or the political world that that, that would be an, an unwise career choice. So, um, Susan, it's a privilege for me to be here today. Thank you for my ability to be here. And I, I'm sorry I don't have slides. I'm just passionate about, uh, you know, providing insights to those that are coming up a generation or two below me. And the geosciences are accurately viewed as a, a critical technical skill to meet mid-century Paris Agreement goals. And that is my career advice as a panelist. I'm done. Thank you, Susan. That's great. I really, really appreciate it. And if you could um, put a link to more information as, as well in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, that's a really valuable insight. Will do. Okay, thank you. So I'm happy to introduce our, our next speaker, Niraj Gupta of Battelle, and he will be talking about emerging practices in CCUS. You're welcome. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, so I can uh, just two buttons here. Let me push both of them. Can you see my screen? Oh. Okay. Not yet. Uh, all right, I think I was on the wrong buttons. How about now? Uh, let's see. How about now? Yes. You're muted. Okay. Uh, how about now? Can you hear me? You're good now. Okay, excellent. I don't know what happened. So. So again, thank you, Susan and AAPG for inviting and putting this together. And Kip, nice to see you. This is our second or third call together today. But uh, I think hopefully I can build some of what you on some what you said uh, with a couple of illustrations about the role for geology. So so actually the slide you're seeing here, you're seeing a picture from an active well, pilot test that we did. I know that I will pick it up. Okay. Uh, so the actual uh, active pilot test that was done a few years ago at a power plant in West Virginia that shows drilling actually right under very high voltage power lines. But the whole purpose of this first test world was to characterize the geology in an unknown area and figure out if you have a storage resource uh, in this case. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip a lot of this slide. This is for introduction or for more reference later on if somebody wants to, but just showing the 
overall value chain of CCUS, uh, in case people are not aware of that, going from a CO2 source, a power plant, refinery, LNG, natural gas processing, cement, steel, whatever you want to call, to separation capture, that's a big technological leap, of course, to reduce the cost and do it at very large scale, compression, pipeline. And then this is what the geologist would be worried about, is the subsurface, injecting it in deep wells, understanding the geology, the reservoirs, and the cap rock and confining zones, and making sure you don't exceed any of your operational limits. What are the big drivers right now? The biggest driver in the US is the 45Q. Yes, there is an increasing acceptance that you have to do something about CO2, and also that you cannot do it without CCUS as a key part of the solution set, in addition to renewables and all the other options. Uh, but in the US, 45Q is a credit system for taxes that says that you can get up to $50 per ton for CO2 injected in the, uh, for permanent storage. Uh, and that's driving a lot of projects currently, <coughs> including the projects that you know, Kip mentioned. But even outside the US, in Europe and everywhere else, Australia, there's a lot of momentum, especially in the North Sea area in Europe. There are many projects being developed. So that's all good for the technology. Uh, in that sense. Uh, so, Batel, we have been working actually on this for 25 years, and this is a really exciting time because it looks like now finally it's getting close to actual commercialization and scale up. There were a couple of other play times in the past, 2008, 9, 10, that it looked pretty imminent, then it sort of went away for a bit. We kept on doing work with DOE funding and with some commercial work uh, in the meantime. And there's many programs. This is the one I'll show you a map for the regional partnership programs in the US, which has really driven a lot of the innovation and effort within the US to show that it can be done and it can be done at scale. And this is you know, what monitoring, modeling, characterization you would need for these technologies. <clears throat> in addition, we work on a number of commercial projects currently under the 45Q and otherwise, uh, anywhere from ethanol plants to natural gas power plants and LNG plants. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of projects being developed in the US and we have a role in several of those. Many other people on the call are doing other projects. Carbon Safe is an example of a DOE pro funded project where they're looking at at least a 50 million ton storage scale. So we have gone in the last 10 years from doing very small scale like 1,000 or 10,000 tons of storage to millions of tons of storage uh, in single well or multiple wells. Uh, we have also done pilot tests and the offshore storage. This is a big, big thing that in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a, there's a lot of things happening. In North Sea, there's a lot of things happening. In Australia, projects are being developed. But also in the US on the Atlantic coast, we have done resource assessment that shows that you can do gigatons of storage of CO2 in this area. And that's really useful because you have a huge industrial base on the East coast of the US but not as many storage targets onshore and also a lot of very crowded areas so that it's hard to do it. And finally, we have a number of international projects, you know, Indonesia, China, uh, uh, South Africa, helping with the World Bank or Asian Development Bank funding to deploy projects in other countries. Currently, we are doing a feasibility for coal to chemicals and then pipeline and storage in the outdoor space and in China. So a couple of slides to build on the regional initiatives and partnerships I mentioned. There were seven regional partnerships that are completing their work this year after about 12 to, or more than 15 years of progress. And DOE has funded recently four regional initiatives. We lead one of those jointly with the University of Illinois. Hannes will be speaking after me, maybe he will mention that too. That regional initiative called MRCI covers 20 states in the Midwest and Northeast US with the idea of addressing technical challenges and ultimately really how to accelerate CCUS deployment. And there's a lot of work for geologists in that. I'll give you two illustrations and I'll shut up after that. This is one example. <clears throat> so this is showing prospective stack storage resources in Eastern Ohio in the Appalachian Basin in the US that shows that multiple formations using existing well data from oil or gas and other wells looking at what formations and layers are conducive to CO2 storage and looking at the resource estimate, just like you do the petroleum resources and oil and gas resources, you have to do carbon storage resources in a given formation before you go too far on a qualifying a project. So here is an example of four stacked layers in Eastern Ohio showing where the storage potential may be. 
And this is early stage, so you have to qualify that with more drilling and more local data. Eventually build static models or geologic models like this that I know all the geologists, including me, we love to do. And the second example I will show is connecting the geology units to reservoirs. So this is an example for, from four or five injection wells that are injecting flowback water or you know, the oil field produced water in Eastern Ohio across multiple counties where we were able to look at the well logs, but combined with the spinner test and the flow meter test, reservoir test to see how continuous these zones are. So this is an example of how the geologists can play a key role in not just defining and characterizing, but also in the operational stages of the CCUS projects. And you know, that's probably where the next 20 years of employment for geologists would come from. I think that's my last slide. Hopefully that was a good over, quick overview for what are the key trends currently and where the need for emphasis would be for the geologists in this field. Oh, that's wonderful. That's very helpful. And, and again, you went through um, a lot of information, very valuable in a brief amount of time and really appreciate it. So this is um, a great summary and we'll have um, time later for some Q&A, but let's move now to Hannes Lanteru, who's at the University of Illinois. So welcome, Hannes. Hi. I am trying to get it up. There we go. Okay. Can it's trying. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Today I'm going to talk. The title is really CCUS and Earth Subsurface Imaging. What I'm talking about is job opportunities. I've had numerous ex students, former students, and uh, people that I worked with used to work in the industry, AAPG members, and said, well, I'm out of work. Can I, how do I get a job in CCUS? Because I see the job applications. Two of the people I know have just, one got an interview because he had worked in our group. Another one uh, didn't get the interview at this point in time. So to add a little bit of levity, was the 2008 Gore plan feasible? And that was power a country with 100% clean electricity within 10 years? No, but we're doing the same thing now. And CCUS is now forward enough that it is part of the solution. Not the whole solution, but part of the solution. We're a changing world. This is the election of the of the new Pope 2005 and 2013. Technology has come everywhere and we need to take the next steps. Where's a mail carrier? This is obviously an older poster mail carrier 200 years ago. Now this is the train 100 years ago, maybe 50 years ago was the planes and now we're instant. What we're looking at is storage opportunities and every one of them has some implications for clean energy, clean generation. We got natural gas storage. That's the old daddy of them all. It's been going on for 70, 80 years. We've learned a lot about risk analysis. And I'm gonna talk about the risks, carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, that what, is, they, they um, but, Susan, yeah. what happened? Indeed. Um, you need to be in, in presentation mode and it's not advancing. It's not advancing. And then put it, click on, there we go. Got okay. it. Oh, and then, but, oh, now you're not in presentation mode anymore. Click on presentation mode. Okay, I, that's what I did. It, it did a minute and then it flipped back. Okay, am I in it? No. Participant, new share. Okay, I'll have to go in the regular mode. There we go. Oh, no, it went back. Well, don't worry about it. I'll do it like this. We can see it. Yeah, a technical gremlin. Anyway. Anyway, carbon capture utilization. We're now into compressed air energy storage. That's an old one, but it's been revitalized with new knowledge. And then we have hydrogen storage and applied germ applied geothermal, we're induced a germal geothermal in the subsurface. CCUS is an emergent industry. 
that's very similar to petroleum geology, except for we have, we have to really worry about the CO2 plume migration, the pressure plumes and leakage pathways, site screening and site selection and reservoir characterization. That's standard petroleum geology. The other thing is commercialization. And now in the US, we come to the class six permit application. That's a pain in the neck. It'll take you, this is a geologic issue with some engineering and then the operators have their own section. And it's, it's a lot of paperwork and the questions, if you start doing it, it's best to read what they're asking. That helps you get an idea what CCUS is partially about, is understanding the EPA concerns. And this is the US EPA vulnerability evaluation. And you see uh, the CO2 geological part, you'll see in there, it's all confining system and injection zones. That's all what you do in petroleum geology, except now you're injecting. So if we go, part of it is key for the EPA and the permits is risk assessment. You look at this as a geologist and you can see multiple things that could go wrong. That's the job of the geologist once we get the site located. What is the issues? What are the risks? We can identify them as a geologist. Then we have to start analyzing what can we do to eliminate or alleviate the risk profile. We can go look at old wells, for example, as one idea. In this case, you could be worried about abandoned oil and gas wells. You could just as well say faults, and you have a CO2 plume that you're injecting. And you say, well, how often that does happen? Well, in the natural gas storage industry, in the Illinois Manlove field, it's a large gas storage field. It went up an old well and it caused the uh, leakage of natural gas into a freshwater aquifer. Luckily, they caught it in time and only a few homes were affected. In Hutchinson Cassins, it, uh, it was natural gas and it moved about seven miles into the uh, city of, Can of Hutchinson and caused some damage. In the near future, what is the future of CP, uh, CCUS? Well, you will have long range pipelines. We work with Narij, and but in many areas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, they don't necessarily have the amount of storage capacity that Illinois has. Illinois, because we have the Mount Simon sandstone that has over 2000 feet of sand uh, and 600 plus feet of reservoirs that have porosities of over 30% and uh, permeabilities over a Darty, we have a lot of capacity. This shows what the future could be. If you start doing it, they're gonna take the sources and make pipelines and put them into the Illinois basin where we have the capability. That means this could be a lot of wells. Is this gonna happen soon? It's already happening. We already have companies coming to us and saying we're a pipeline company or we're an energy company. Where is the place, best lowest risk place to store CC carbon dioxide? So it's already happening. It's not the near future, it's here. And we look at it, then we have to model and this is where the geologists and the uh, engineers have to wear together is if you're putting that many sources into the ground with these pipelines, there's gonna be interaction because they're all going in the same formation mostly into the Mount Simon. Now, is the plumes gonna interact? Probably not. The range of the CO2 plume itself is only somewhere around maybe 15 miles for a long-term multi-million dollar a year, multi-million ton a year project. But the plumes, the pressure plumes are the per issue. They're gonna start interacting with each other. And it's, the question is how fast is gonna interact? And is it gonna change the modeling that you did? You did a modeling in an isolated area and said, you don't have to worry about anything. Now we're gonna have interactions. And this is where 
geology comes in. The geologists and the engineers have to figure this out. Otherwise, the industry is going to fail. So to summarize, there's a lot of opportunities. It's, a, it's an area that geologists that have experience, geophysicists and engineers, can make an, a real case for understanding what your risk assessment is, what the opportunities are. And if you understand that, you can make it a success. This is now becoming a commercial enterprise and the geology has to be done. And that is my uh, presentation. So thank you. That, that was amazing. That's really helpful. Really good. Thank you, Hannes. So our, our last panelist for this ses section, and then we'll have a quick discussion, is um, Feng Chao of Maxar. Hello, uh, uh, let me share my slides. Um, hello, everyone, can you hear me? Uh, hello, everyone, my, uh, everyone. my name is Feng yes. Zhao. I'm a senior scientist working at the Maxar. And uh, uh, first of all, I feel really honored to uh, join the uh, uh, conference, uh, which is my first time. Uh, second, thanks, uh, Susan, for organizing this meeting uh, so that I have this opportunity to introduce Maxar to you guys uh, to see how we can contribute to the um, conference. And uh, Maxar is a not, uh, not a new company. Uh, it has been uh, the industry leader in high res satellite, satellite imagery and the geospatial information. Um, the name probably is new, but it has, it has been has been this field for so many years and uh, um, probably before like uh, 25 years ago. Uh, currently, uh, it's the uh, number one in the global Im imagery sales and uh, it has uh, um, a lot of uh, collaborations with many governments across the globe and uh, it has 25 years of commercial imagery leadership and has been collaborating with a lot of customers across the world. And not only we provide the data to the customers, but also we design, owns and, op and op op operate our satellites. And that we provide the ground system infrastructure and imagery for, for production. And uh, here are our satellites, as you can see, we have four satellites in operation. We have World War, World War II, one, GI one, World War II, and World War II three. And we have three others retired, four um, in operation. And uh, for later this year, we're going to launch uh, six uh, new satellites. And we call it Legion. And as you can see, that most of our satellites provide data with, at the sub meter level. And for the future, uh, we're going to provide uh, like six more high, uh, uh, high performance satellites so that we can provide 15 visits per day across the globe. Uh, that will triple max our capacity to collect uh, 30 meter imagery. And here's the spectral band that our Maxa uh, uh, imagery has, you can see totally it has 16 bands. It has uh, eight uh, infrared, uh, uh, visible infrared, and also had eight uh, shrubble infrared. Um, this wide range of spectral bands can provide a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities for many applications, not only for the um, like the land cover land use, feature extraction, a change detection, uh, like carbon uh, related, uh, carbon uh, content related activities, um, also can be used for the oil, oil gas geology applications. And uh, here I provide a couple of exa examples uh, showing how our data has been used. And the first example is the land cover classification. You can see here is the uh, landscape landscape, including a variety of 
um, uh, land cover types like the water, uh, the forest, the grass, the soil, and urban. And as you can see, based on spectral uh, bands, we can see the conifers, we can see the deciduous trees, or we can see the grasses, we can see the soil, we can see the man made uh, uh, features like uh, the urban, uh, the road, the kind of uh, man made features. And also at a high level of details uh, compared with like a medium or a medium level data, uh, medium uh, re level data like 20 meters, 80 meters, even 2.5 meters, we can uh, reach to uh, a very uh, deep level of details. We can get a lot of uh, uh, like our data is at 0.5 meters. We can see each individual crown. We can identify a lot of species based on uh, spectral information. And also our data can be used for the first inventories. Uh, here's an example uh, showing that uh, we can see um, like natural forest, illegal logging, um, palm plantation, uh, like uh, by uh, using a variety of uh, band com combinations. And another example is the 3D uh, 3D information. So we have the image data by using sterols, we can uh, we can get the uh, 3D information. Uh, that means um, uh, the three D information can be used to compare with the light li li lidar data. Uh, for example, lidar can provide the canopy height for for the tree height. Um, our imagery data can also provide similar information. Uh, here you can see two images. The left one is a lidar canopy height model. The right one is the Maxa three D digital surface model. And even though they are not directly comparable, because one is the canopy height, the other is the digital surface model. But you can see spectrally, uh, especially our digital service model can characterize the spatial distribution of the three dimensional information. And uh, in the future, we're going to provide, uh, also provide the canopy height model. The, the canopy height model at 0 0.5 meters can be uh, similar to the LIDAR canopy height model. So based on the canopy heights, we can derive the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the carbon sequestration measures like above ground biomass. Uh, to sum up, um, our data uh, can be used for a variety of uh, CCUS related activities like uh, REDD plus um, MRV activities, forest manage management activities, and also biodiversity related activities. And uh, I'll wrap up with the uh, couple messages uh, and uh, we're gonna launch the new satellites. Uh, which will be six new uh, six new satellites in um, in this year, uh, probably in, in around like uh, November or December, and uh, it's the first high res eight and sixteen bands commercial satellite data, and uh, it will be used uh, in a variety of applications uh, like a resource exploitation and management, land use, coastal, forestry, agriculture, pollution, environment uh, monitoring. Uh, gross market chain detection monitoring. That's uh, um, what we can do with our max data. And if you have any questions, please send the uh, email to my, um, here you can see my email. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that was great. Okay, so we have a few questions. We have a little bit of time. Um, so we're doing, uh, we have the time for a few questions, not, not a lot, but that's okay. Um, then we'll have our technology showcase, then we'll have time for more questions. So let's just take one or two from the audience. The first one is from Edwin Vargas. What regions of South America are being studied and are viable for CCUS technology usage? Anybody want to take that one? Any CCUS in South America? Uh yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know about what region. I'm sure that uh, there are some maps on a global scale, but offshore, Brazil, Petrobras has been doing the Lula project for several years, and I believe there's one more project under consideration. So it's been going on, but it de definitely can be and should be scaled up, not just for oil and gas fields, but you know, I'm guessing there's a lot of ethanol production, for example, in uh, Brazil that call for, you know, it produces a 
pure CO2 that can be injected at lower cost than uh, a low purity source. So there should be more work on that, but there is at least one ongoing project for the last several years. Oh, great, thank you. So here's a question for everyone with pipeline permits opposed by the government, just how will you build CO2 pipelines? I don't think all pipelines are, uh, are negative. The one that you, everybody thinks about is the one that went from the heavy oil in Canada. And that was different than an anti-pipeline, it was an anti-oil. So how do you deal with the highly corrosive CO2? As far as pipeline or uh, uh, in general, uh, obviously, if you know if you're doing a pipeline for CO2, you want to make sure that CO2 is very dry, which is what they do right now. Mm -hmm. There's three to 4,000 miles of pipelines currently operational. They have been operational for many years in the US. They have all operated safely. And of, of course, you have to have the right protocols for the composition, uh, mm -hmm. the humidity or the moisture level, but also the materials that you select. And the second thing is there's a lot of you know, you know uh, movement or momentum towards CO2 pipeline networks. Hannah showed an example of the sort of Midwestern area, uh, but there is a momentum towards in, including in the infrastructure bill that's being looked at in the Congress currently. Incentive to build pipelines which are scaled up so that as new sources come online, they can use that pipeline infrastructure uh, to move CO2 where it can be injected. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so about migration and reservoirs, we need to understand this. Um, um, so, oh, okay. So um, I guess I was reading your answer to Frank Mines. <laughs> <laughs> I so, you want to uh, explain your answer? We'll go a little bit more. Yeah, depth. I think the, the question is about migration in the reservoirs once you inject the CO2. And there's obviously two things. One is migration within the reservoir. So just like you do CO2 enhanced oil recovery or water injection, uh, you need to understand what your geology is, uh, permeability, porosity, structure, and be able to build reliable models with that to see how far the CO2 will go and what's the pressure footprint. At the same time, you want to make sure that the CO2 you inject will not go across cap rock into the shallower formations. So make sure that you're, you know the cap rock permeability and be able to predict and say that you can inject it safely within the reservoir, but not have it move outside the reservoir. Okay, great. And then we have, uh, I think it's time for um, maybe one or two more. Uh, what is the current time frame for a UIC class six permit? And what will it need to be in order to for wider commercial adoption? Okay, for uh, Anna, do you want to take that or should I? Uh, we've had, it's over a year to get it going. The first ones took almost two years. I think they're getting faster as they're getting more experience in asking the right questions. But we plan for over a year. And that's only to get the preliminary stuff going. Then they will go and say, well, you need another drill, drill another well, or you're going to need some more additional data. So it can extend more than a year easily. Larry, you want to add anything to it? Uh, no, I think that, you know, obviously faster is better uh, for permitting, but you know, by the time they do all the reviews, public, public comment and stuff, it's at least one year, probably closer to two years. Okay, great. And here's a, a question. Um, so for um, CCUS as a geologist or geophysicist, um, even geochemistry, would, what would you focus on? Geochemical, geochemistry, or would you specialize in, in um, being a structural ge geophys geologist mm -hmm. or? Um, There's room for all of them. What we didn't discuss is one of the risks that we are looking at is induced seismicity. So yes. you have a geophysical problem, you have a structural problem, and then we have experience with natural gas storage fields. 
where they didn't do the structural geology properly, and they put the gas storage field in the middle of a fault and it leaks to the surface. So all of them come into play. How long, if you're doing CO2, it reacts with clay minerals. What happens then? How, what happens to your permeabilities as it reacts with the clays in the reservoir? It's going to either reduce it, it's going to change it. We're looking right now at a karst uh, where we have 10 or more Darcy's in permeability in, in literally caves that we are looking at evaluating for sequestration. How do you handle that? It's in a, a dolomite. So it's going to be fairly slow, but there's going to be reactions there. How far does it go? Can we highlight where the direction of the karst is? And it depends on the thicknesses. It might be possible, but you've got so many different parameters. When I put up that slide, it had every one of what a geologist or a geophysicist does was in there. And to do the permit, you're going to need all that expertise because almost every single thing that you learn in geology, 101 or onward, is going to be related to getting the permit and understanding your risk and economic resources available. How much storage do you have? That's great. Yeah, and then also, I guess, on, an ongoing monitoring and everything. So um, thank you. This was wonderful. And we'll have some time after um, our technology showcase. I'd like to turn the, uh, the, the monitor or the, the platform over to Rekha Patel, or if, um, if she'd like me to make Edgar co-host, I will. So uh, thank you, Susan, for this opportunity and uh, for partnering with us on the discussion uh, forum side uh, for the pivoting series. Um, we're excited to present today, especially because uh, as of today now, all the challenges that you have been putting up in uh, the discussion forums will now be available at the top level of the platform. So I'm hoping that everybody that have be, has been coming in for discussions will have an easier uh, time to look at the um, challenges and soon to be within a week or so, we'll also have the uh, past recordings uh, at the top level. So we're trying to help you navigate through a little bit better. So with that, yes, I am going to turn over uh, the platform to uh, my colleague, Edgar, who will present uh, the platform, Zrathas. Edgar. Sounds good, thank you, Rekha. And thanks a lot for the invite for this fantastic presentation. Um, so I will get started um, showcasing how our Stratos Communities platform is able to provide um, hosting for these challenges, as Rekha mentioned, as well as how you can take advantage of this for the different type of projects that you can work on. So here, as I log in with my account, um, you, you can see the available uh, challenges that we have in our platform right now being hosted. Um, one of those, as you can see, are related to the, uh, the pivoting challenge. And also we, we have one which is related to our geothermal thermal lease evaluation challenge here. So uh, you'll be able to browse in our communities platform and you know, take a preview of those challenges and see which one you're interested on. If you're interested in a particular one, you'll be able to, you, you can join that particular challenge. And in this particular case, I already have joined one. So I'll be able to open that project. So as you can see, and you open that particular challenge, you'll be able to see uh, the description about the challenge, what's the goal for the challenge, if there's any rewards, um, you'll be able to pull more detailed description about it. Um, you'll be able to observe also the data set related to that particular challenge. In this case, we have a couple of resources, external resources that we support in, in, the, in our platform, as well as some um, resources that have been uh, attached as part of the challenge here. So in this particular case, we have just for the moment a PDF. Um, in the future, you know, if the challenge administrator decides to provide a new version of the data set, or any additional data that wants to be available as part of the challenge that can be available and make available to all the participants that are taking the challenge. And that's automatically being added to our Stratos Hub workspace, which I'm going to go into more detail in a second. Another important aspect of this is that we have our Stratos clusters. So the idea with our Stratos clusters is our discussion areas for all of our community. Um, 
as you can see here, you will see the related cluster topics about this particular challenge below. So the main intention of this is to bring in as much information as possible to you right away based on the context that you're working on. So if you're working on a particular project, in this case, this challenge it will bring you all the information that you might need uh, very close to you. So now um, I'm going to launch our Stratos uh, Hub workspace. So you can do that by clicking the Launch Workspace button here. Our Stratos Hub workspace is our pre-configured on-demand data science environment. Um, this is uh, the most popular libraries, data science libraries, kernels, um, uh, and frameworks are already pre-configured for you. Uh, we support different templates for our environments. We have a CPU only environment, a CPU plus GPU, depending on your needs for your project, right? So that's something that can be customizable, right? So here, as I launch this, um, there's no need to install anything. Everything is being done you know, online, as you can see directly from the browser. And you can see the different technology that we have support out of the box, right? So if you want to you know, play with Python, uh, Julia, Octave, or R, some of the most uh, famous, you know, popular languages out there for you to start, you know, prototyping, start working your solution, those are already available for you. Uh, one important aspect of this is also, um, because I opened this in the context of the challenge I'm working on, you can see here that it's automatically mounted some of my projects. So we can see APGs here available for me, and I can see my geothermal thermal lease evaluation challenge available for me directly. So, and I'll be able to access the data related to this particular challenge right away. Um, in this case, it was the PDF that I showcased. So I'll be able to open this and I'll be able to access that particular file, which is related to my challenge, right? So what we want to do with this is uh, part of a challenge, data set, code resources, any other files related to the challenge will be available to you right away into your pre-configured workspace for you not to worry about any setup at all you just go ahead, go in there and start working on solving that particular problem. Uh, with that, Rika, that's all I have for my side. Thank you. Um, uh, Susan, do you want to go into the collaborator side? Um, well, let's give the, I'll give everybody a little bit of background. So on the challenges, they relate to our different weeks. And so the reason for having them is to, to give you a chance to actually work with a real problem. And so in the case of the lease, Criterion EP is a real company and that's a real lease and a real geothermal lease and they need, actually need um, um, assistance. And so what we're, this will give you actual opportunity to get some experience. And we're working with um, Srathis and with Criterion and we will um, give you a certificate of, of or just like if, after you finish a challenge. And we we'll want this to, to, to grow. We have an Imperial Barrel Award, which has kind of similar things for oil and gas that we're, we're expanding. This is where we're doing it for other, other energies. So geothermal, and we would like to, I'd like to work with Hannes and Niraj to put together a challenge for CCUS. And then, um, there are there are no cash prizes, but we are looking toward building this out to see what we can build it into. So um, anyway, so um, we might go through and, and Rick could just let people like let's go back to the very beginning of Zarathus so that people can know how to navigate and find the challenges. And, I, and also, I'm really going to work with the divisions, DPA, EMD, and also the Sustainability Committee, and also in, in, in um, and it's oh, the platform. It's not for students; it's for everybody. So we really, what we really hope are, is that people who are working professionals seeking to diversify sink their teeth into these actual problems and get practice, and then they can put that in their resume that they've, they've uh, participated in, in this. Okay, so I'll be happy to show you how to get to those challenges. So basically, as you come into the Stratus win main website, uh, you'll be able to create an account. Um, you'll be able to sign in for an account, uh, sign up for an account. So you can do it from the top side or also here in the bottom, you will see a sign up option. 
Um, so let me just quickly do that, right? So you'll be able to, if you haven't joined, uh, you'll be able to see it here below, right? You'll be able to sign up for Stratus using your email or any of the other providers' accounts. Um, once you have your account, you'll be able to sign in. Um, if you don't have an account, you can also create one from here. You can uh, freely sign up for now. So once you sign in, you'll be able to then um, browse all the channels, uh, all the challenges, sorry, by going on your connect dashboard on the left side. And you can click the challenges button here, and then you'll be able to uh, display all the challenges that are currently going on in our platform. So that's the way to navigate. So first you need to, just need to create a free account uh, once you subscribe uh, and you will be able to sign in and then just access these challenges and then join them as needed. And also you'll feel free to join our conversation in our clusters, our discussion boards. And like Susan mentioned, you know, if you go to the APG collaborators page, you will find more details about the future sessions also. And, and I'd like to say that on the uh, collaboration, the, the point is too that you can continue a conversation. So for example, if Amanda or Ron or Kip or Niraj or Hannes or, or Fen would like to um, join and go into tonight's um, um, cluster was called or a topic, that would be, if you scroll down uh, session nine, um, it, it, that gives you a chance, and we and we've changed some of the topics based on demand. But at any rate, we will. Um, yeah, this is the Earth imaging. I think it's the red one. Yeah. So anyway, so what we'll do is we'll add more places where you can actually put links. And I'd like, and as I was saying, we want to put together a challenge. It gives you some some opportunities to work with real data sets and work with the real issues. It won't be as complicated as real life, but you know, like at least a simple data set. And then you get um, basically a, a building block approach where you get to at least take that first step and, and build that first building block in your, in your professional development. Right, and I, I might add, Susan, that some of the challenges, the earlier challenges, especially that Susan has crafted uh, at the back end of these sessions, uh, they're more uh, for discussions, they're more ideation, brainstorming type uh, challenges. Yes. You can find those and have discussions. And then if uh, a few of you decide to go ahead and create a workshop around that um, topic to go ahead and uh, talk further and extend it, convert it into a challenge, you're going to be able to do that. Or if you decide to go ahead and create a project and work on it, you're going to be able to do that. So uh, we understand four types of different projects in here. One, you know, one's like a personal project, then there's the challenges. Uh, help me out here, Edgar. Yeah, so we had the team projects, then we have the challenge projects, which are crowdsourcing, right? That's something yeah. that we want to put here for crowdsourcing across our community. Um, and then um, it's up to you to decide the level of exposure you want to have, right? You can maybe start with a personal one, and then you want to invite a couple of colleagues or a couple of, you know, parts, uh, members of the community that they can help you and collaborate inside the project, right? So you decide the level of exposure you want to have in that project, and that's something that we provide control on that. Yeah. And there's a question in the chat. This is, we're, we're partnering with APG, or with uh, APG's partnering with Strathus, <laughs> I was reading while I was, <laughs> and, and so basically it's, um, you don't have to, to enter it through the, any kind of APG portal, but we do plan to build it out so that there might be some events where you can show off this, or at any rate, um, this is this is an initial in its initial stages, and we we're really excited about potential. So thank you, thank you, Rika. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. So um, thank you, and I'd like to see if there are any questions. Um, Amanda, I was going to ask you to like maybe circle back. It was really exciting to to. Uh, hear what you were talking about, about the carbon mapper and 
and just what you see is the future. Um, I was it, I um, I, there's a lot more hyperspectral sensors that are, are coming on board right now. Um, there's two in space cur currently. We have DSIS, which is uh, visible in near infrared, and you can detect various gases with that. Um, and then there's also PRISMA, which is an Italian sensor. I've started seeing data from that, and it looks pretty good. Um, and it has a panchromatic channel, so you can sharpen it, and the image quality is looking really good. And then there's uh, three different companies, at least, that are looking at um, hyperspectral small sats. Uh, NASA's looking at a, a bigger mission, probably in the 2026 timeframe. Um, but it seems like we've gotten to the point where hyperspectral technology has gotten a little bit less expensive to build. People know how to manage the data better. Um, plus, there's better storage opportunities. So I, I see it becoming more of a management tool for being able to understand monitoring in, in those kinds of situations than it has in the past, where it was like you might get one Avarice flight a year, and that's it. And so you can't really you know, see any changes that are happening or see things progress. And I think it'll be part of the uh, the monitoring um, requirements that are going to be imposed, like I said, from various regulatory agencies. And you know, where L3 Harris fits in, or at least my little group of it, is we developed the software that works really well with hyperspectral data and has libraries um, that help you understand like what absorption features are and how deep they are and, and, and help turn that into something that's numerically relatable uh, to the information that you have on the ground. Oh, that's, that's great. That's really interesting. And it makes me think that what, um, what you're doing with satellites and also Maxar would work integrate really well with what Ron Bell is doing with the drones. So, uh, Ron, would you like to uh, speak a little bit to that? Yeah, Ron, you're on. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm. Um, yeah, it, it it it's totally integratable. I mean, the 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 advantage of of drones is that we now can acquire things, uh, data at a at a definition rate. At a, at a definition that we've not been so far uh, able to do from satellites, and yet um, it's it's fully integratable. I um, I don't, don't know what else to say to that. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. So it would work really well, for example, planning uh, pipelines. So yeah. some of these car uh, CO two pipelines. You, you oh, can yeah. get high, high resolution at, and the big picture from the satellites. And yeah, then, one, one of the things that we're working on is the integration of the, the geophysical data to identify. In fact, I'm very much focused on pipelines to use the geophysical data, the, the EM tools, the magnetic tools, the hyperspectral tools to uh, data that comes from that we can do with drones uh, to actually start better understanding the health of a pipeline or the uh in in it, it to us it's 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 just the, the path forward but to uh, to the satellite data really is a sort of a broader view uh approach to it and then we come in and do the detail and I, and i guess that's the uh, the message that i would like to to share so yeah that's a really good point ron the the scalability of being able to get centimeter level um, basic pixels, but just get that high resolution view so that you can understand planning uh, for pipelines and, and infrastructure, and as well as there's hyperspectral um, sensors that can set on drones and can do very localized analytics. Um, if you're in an area that either is not getting much satellite coverage or just wanna have a higher um, resolution product uh, for understanding what's happening in your area. So I think there's there's a lot that can be done from, you know, very, you know, very tight scaled all the way up to very big pixels. Oh, that's great. So just a reminder, everybody will be getting a copy of the recording. So we can go back and go through the different, you can, uh, the different presentations. And um, I'd like to um, turn the platform over to Hannes for, few minutes for some final words. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, 
it's got messed up when I first did this uh, with the PowerPoint, but we have storage opportunities are not just in carbon capture utilization and storage. We have projects right now in compressed air energy storage where we're worried about, we have modeling, good modeling of CO2 movement, natural gas movement, but now compressed air has different viscosities, different buoyancies. Those are all things that have to work in. Hydrogen storage is a, is a really complex system in that it's small, it's buoyant. How do we store it in the subsurface? Those are problems we're currently, my group is trying to solve. And we've seen some talks on applied geothermal. In this case, we're looking at right now, how do we use the subsurface? We have excess energy from renewable sources. What do you do with that? One method is of course, compressed air energy storage. Another method is heat the subsurface up so we have a geothermal system. It may not, it may be an artificial geothermal system, but it's a real, how much storage capacity do we have for the geothermal systems? All of those are geologic and engineering problems. And we can't just look at CCUS, all of these natural gas storage. My group has been working on it for 25 years. And there's still issues that we're trying to resolve. So there's opportunities for geologists, geophysicists, and engineers. Will it be as great as in the oil and gas industry? Probably not. But every major oil company and pipeline company is looking at this. They have every major company has a group that is doing CCUS and probably the others to understand how they can make it economic and make it profitable. Oh, that's great. It's so uplifting and, and inspiring. Well, I looked at the time. We're just about out of time. So we have um, a few moments for our president, Rick Chris. Thanks, Susan. Again, thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to all the participants. And, uh, a lot of good information here, and uh, you can reach it. You know, it's it's recorded. So, and uh, uh, look forward to look forward to the next pivot point. Well, thank you. So, really appreciate it. And if um, if anyone has any questions, please contact me. And um, look forward to future meetings with you. So, thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Adios. Thanks, <laughs> Thank everyone. You. Have a great one. Thanks. Bye.